Hello, I'm Gabby Pfeiffer. I'm a lecturer in psychology here at the University of Southampton. And in today's video course, we're going to look at brain imaging techniques. So I'll be covering three imaging techniques today. Firstly, we'll start out with post-mortem techniques, then looking at magnetic resonance imaging techniques, and finally electroencephalography, or EEG for, for short. So as we go through those, those techniques, I'm going to say a little bit about the technique itself, and then look at the basic mechanisms of the technique, and also the knowledge we can gain from the technique, as well as its limitations. So let's begin with brain postmortem examinations. Now, brain postmortem examinations are one of the oldest methods for imaging the brain, right? They've been around way before um, any other sophisticated technology has become available to image the brain. Now, postmortem is Latin for after death. And so the technique involves extracting the brain from the skull after the person has passed away. Sometimes it is also referred as, to as brain autopsy. Now, brain autopsies are not routinely performed. They're usually performed when they are being requested for forensic reasons. Say, for example, to determine the cause of death in case the person has passed away under suspicious circumstances. And where it is believed that an exam of the brain could give further clues about the, death of the, the cause of the death of the person. Another reason why they might be performed is for research and medical purposes. And this will also be the um, focus of this video. So in this case, we would usually um, investigate the brain of neuropsychological patients who have demonstrated a particular behavior during their lifetime um, that suspects or that su suggests brain damage. And by examining their brains post-mortem, we then hope to find out more about the relationship between their particular behavior and, and any brain damage. Another reason why post-mortem exams might be performed is um, in famous cases. So, for example, Albert Einstein's brain has been examined to um, find out more about the relationship between his, his brain anatomy and his high mathematical functioning. So let me tell you a little bit about the basic mechanisms of post-mortem techniques. The technique involves extracting the brain from the skull to allow studying the physical brain. So it's quite an invasive technique and is typically performed by a trained pathologist or a neuroanatomist. Now, post-mortem exams are carried out as soon as possible, typically within two to three working days of, um, after the person's death. And the brain sits uh, deep within the skull's protective bony tissue and is then further surrounded by a thick uh, connective tissue called the dura mater. So dura mater stands for hard mother. And um, the pathologist will have to open the, the, the person's skull and remove the dura mater in order to get to the brain. In that state, the brain is a pinkish looking and quite a squishy substance, um, which will have to be um, fixed in a, in a certain chemical called formalin. So they're gonna put it in, a, in this chemical to give it a texture that is similar to a hard rubber ball. And then it is ready for further examination of any different anatomical brain structures. So I have a brain here next to me, which I'm going to demonstrate. So this is a human, life-size human brain model, uh, not an actual post-mortem brain, but a plastic brain, although it does show the same, uh, very similar um, neuroanatomical structures. So what you can see on the brain is the um, entire cerebral cortex, and we can also nicely see the two cerebral hemispheres, the right and the left hemisphere. And uh, there is a, a large gap running through those two hemispheres, the, the so-called so longitudinal fissure, and I hope you can also see how convoluted and wrinkled the cortex is. And um, if we stretched out the cortical surface, it'd be far too big to fit into our skull. And so as the brain has evolved over many thousands of years, it had to wrinkle up in order to fit inside the skull. And uh, one further thing I'd like to show is the little cerebellum here in the back, which is um, Latin for little brain. So apart from the neuroanatomical insights that we gain from looking at the brain, we might be more interested in looking at neuropsychological patients 
and find out more about um, their brain behavior relationship. Now, there are unfortunately a number of people who suffer injuries to their brains, such as strokes or motor accidents, or they might sustain, sustain a neurodegenerative disorder like Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia um, or Parkinson's disease. And the location of the injury and the resulting behavioral changes will tell us something about the function of that particular brain area. One example is the discovery by the French anatomist Paul Proker, who worked with patients who were still able to comprehend uh, language and they had normal mental functioning, but they were unable to speak or produce any language. And following autopsy after the patient's death, Broca found damage that was localized in the, brain, in the person's left prefrontal cortex. So I'll show you where that is. It's on the left hemisphere here, and this is sort of the area of the prefrontal cortex. And this area later became, became known as Broca's area, named after the person's, after Paul Broca, um, which we now know is involved in speech production. Similarly, um, a new, another neuroanatomist, um, Carl Wernicke, worked with patients who were unable to comprehend language, but they were still able to speak. So following the autopsy of Wernicke's patients, he found um, that his patients had um, a lesion in an area further back in the brain. So still on the left hemisphere, but further back here in an area called the temporal lobe. This area is now known as Wernicke's area, which we now know is involved in speech comprehension. So here we have two complementary uh, but opposite patient behavior patterns, right? One patient was able to speak but not comprehend, and the other one was able to comprehend but not speak. And this in, uh, in neuropsychology is called a double dissociation. And that's, a, that's an important finding whereby two patients have opposite but complementary patterns of behavior here related to speech. Right? And, in, and double dissociations are, can conclusively demonstrate that the two complementary functions are localized, localized in different areas of the brain. And that is very strong evidence for a modular account of language. Right? There are two modules in the brain, one responsible for language production and another for language comprehension. So let me tell you a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses of post-mortem examinations. In terms of strengths, um, they've been very influential in informing theories of cognitive functioning, such as language and memory, um, via these double dissociations. And they're also quite powerful in, in sort of establishing causal relationships between the impaired brain area and the patient's behavior, really suggesting that the damage to a brain area causes the person's behavior. Now, we need to see that with caution, right? We can only make such strong claims after we have tested a number of, of brains and, and the person's behavior. And this brings me to the limitations of post-mortem exams. They're very often based on single case studies for the reason that very few patients demonstrate exactly the same brain damage. So there's not enough patients to compare against. And uh, it also is the case that the brain damage is usually not confined to one particular brain area, right? If someone has a stroke, um, it may result in a lesion that affects one particular brain area, but also surrounding areas. So the, um, the patient's behavior may therefore not just result from damage to Broca's area, but also from the surrounding um, brain damage. We're also missing out on the individual differences. So to what extent is the patient's behavior influenced by variables other than brain damage? For example, by their personality, by their age, by their sex, and so on. So we need a larger population sample to make convincing claims about the brain behavior relationship. There are some ethical considerations that we need to take into account, um, whether the person has been able to give full informed consent before death, uh, to allow those post-mortem examinations. And if the person um, has a severe psychological disorder, like a severe memory loss or is unconscious, they won't be able to, to give this uh, informed consent. So there may be ethical issues about whether or not we can conduct po post-mortem exams. And then finally also, 
the modularity I spoke about earlier, the assumption that brain regions represent modules with very specific independent functions uh, seems rather simplistic. We now know that the, the brain is much more complex and the functions are often widely distributed across the cortex and also in deeper cortical structures. Post-mortem techniques are um, positive for many things, have given us um, a lot of information about different cognitive theories, but we need other brain, uh, brain imaging techniques to obtain converging evidence to establish the brain behavior relationships.